Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for joining the Truth Seeker Project again. Um, I'm very honoured to have as my guest today, Reverend Roy Catchpole, uh, an Anglican clergyman, now retired. Roy, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about your life before the circumstances you're going to tell us about today? Um, yeah, uh, when I was uh, very young, uh, about 10 years old, um, I was uh, taken into custody by the local policeman um, for stealing a bicycle. Um, I had become a runaway uh, from home because of a violent father and uh, decided that I would go to London and uh, because I'd heard the streets were paved with gold in London and uh, I understood that gold was quite a precious commodity and I could just pick some stuff up. So, But in order to get there, I needed to know the way. And um, I knew the way because there was a road in Ipswich, where I was born, uh, that said London Road. And so I thought, well, if I just go along London Road, I'll get to London. So I stole a, a butcher's bike and uh, filled it up with vegetables and various bits and pieces and set off to London. But I was stopped by the local Bobby, a chap called Bomber Harris, who uh, uh, hit me around and took me home. And my father beat me up, so I, I never tried to run away again. Um, but um, I was born in, a, in, in the slum uh, by the dock's side uh, in Ipswich. And we were flooded out with the high spring uh, tide one year. And then uh, we were moved out to a local um, corporation housing estate where I spent all my years growing up, really, until I was 19. Um, at, during that time, um, I and my friends uh, made a regular habit of taking and driving away motor vehicles without the consent of the owner. Um, that was good fun and that was where I learned to drive which meant the good aspect of that was that um, when I became a grown up person um, I only had to have one uh, lesson for driving and I passed my test first time but it did result um, all of this uh, behaviour in my being sent to uh, Borstal um, where I spent uh, just over uh, two and a half years having absconded from various Borstals twice. Um, and I had ended up in uh, Rochester Borstal, which is where the little village of Borstal is situated. It was where the first Borstal um, was established in Borstal, which later became Rochester Prison, which is where I spent uh, many months uh, as, a, as a prisoner there. It was there that I became... Um, an evangelical Christian um, and uh, it was there uh, in my um, dormitory there um, that I believed that I heard um, a spiritual call uh, from God uh, to become a vicar in the Church of England. A real arrogance for a snot-nosed working-class kid with no education but there you go. And, and that was what happened. I went off and got some degrees and managed to get the bishop to ordain me. And uh, since 1974, I've been an Anglican clergyman, a, a vicar in the Church of England. I mean, that's briefly, that's it. So, so that you would have assumed was your life path set? That's it. Yeah, yeah. I was looking forward to um, having had a, a, a quite a full ministry, really, uh, since 1974, um, that I would coast along into retirement and eventual death uh, as a nice middle class Anglican clergyman mm. who'd learned um, to speak with an accent that wasn't from Suffolk, where <laughs> they talk like this down there. <laughs> oh, we don't talk like that anymore. That's not quite, I can't really do it well these days. Yeah, yeah. And then, 
and and then um about six years ago now uh i was visited at my house by two young detectives who said that uh, a woman in the parish had made an allegation of sexual assault uh and they wanted to um, interview me. They wanted to take me to the local custody suite, which is about 30 miles away from where I live. Um, so quite innocently, I said, well, um, well, I won't come with you. I'll, I'll, I'll follow in the car because it will soon be over. I can drive myself home. But I didn't realize that this was in fact um, an arrest. I was being arrested. Um, and was later charged um, with uh, 13 counts of sexual assault uh, against this woman uh, from my congregation. Um, and what, I think, what, what goes through your mind when, when you're presented with that out in nowhere? Well, it's, it, it's just totally confusing. I mean, I, I, I knew that uh, th this this hadn't happened, um, and um, I thought, well, it didn't occur to me. I mean, I got no friends who would do this as a joke, as a practical joke. Um, but I just thought, well, they've obviously got this wrong. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, they've got it wrong. But but um, in in the the custody suite, in uh, I was being kept in the cell there in Weymouth. Um, and and I, because of my history, I mean, I was asked by the policeman, um, "Have you ever been arrested before?" And of course, well, yes, the answer was yes, about forty years ago or, or longer. So I had to answer yes, and from that moment on, um, I knew that uh, the arresting officer and those involved in this case. Um, had their suspicions, as far as they were concerned, confirmed. Here was a man who had already been arrested, and when my, I told them my history, um, was clearly quite probably a guilty person. I mean, um, part of the interviewing process um, on arrival uh, at the custody suite is, um, do you have um, any tattoos? And indeed, I do have a tattoo, which is that one. <laughs> yeah. Which was given to me um, by two of the lads in Roger, in, in, in Wormwood Scrubs um, with the threat that if I didn't have that done, um, they would beat me up and we were three in a cell. So I preferred to have that done. <laughs> but that's a prison tattoo. And so... I was sitting in the cell and I said uh, to Jesus, you know, is this, is this how it, it's all going to end? Um, I think that was, that was one of the low points. This was then followed by a long interview of about three hours. Um, but I was kept in, in the custody suite um, until three o'clock in the morning. Uh, when I was then dumped outside to make my own way home, 30 miles with no transport. Um, at that time, I didn't know it, but I was already suffering from a, a, um, a terminal cancer. Um, I was very tired, very lonely, very low, very abandoned. My wife was at home. Um, I had no phone. They'd taken that away from me. So I, it was like being that abandoned child at 10 you know, 10 years old, who had been forced into a situation where I was once again alone. Yeah. Devastating. You know, you think, well, no, just a minute, you know, here's, here's a well-educated middle-class clergyman, you know, who, who knows about life, but actually beneath all of this uh, is that abandoned, neglected, abused child. Yeah of, you know, seven, uh, nearly 70 years ago. So from that point, 
over the next months, weeks and months, how did your life change? What, how did things progress from there? Uh, the, the day after my arrest, I had a, the first visit ever and the only visit I've ever had in all of my years of ministry uh, from the archdeacon. That's the boss vicar and uh, who came to our house. We were both, as you can imagine, quite devastated, not knowing what to do. We'd had no legal training or we were just totally confused. We had no solicitor, no representation, no friends um, uh, who would know any of this stuff. Um, and, and he called to, re, uh, to deprive me of my permission to officiate as a priest, which is a document given by the, the Bishop of the Diocese to allow you to preach, uh, teach, uh, do any pastoral work, visiting, or anything that a vicar normally does, funerals, weddings. Um, so really, basically, it was the removal of my right and privilege to be able to be a priest in the Church of England. And this is within a within day or two day. of the... A day? Within a few hours. I mean, I was released at three o'clock in the morning. The Archdeacon arrived um, that day, um, five or six hours later. One of his first calls of the day, I would imagine. And was there an explanation? Sorry? Was there an explanation why why this was being taken away from you? No. He, he, well, he explained that... that um, that the church had been informed that I'd been arrested and that he'd come to collect uh, the document for my permission to um, operate as a priest, which I gave him, of course, because I didn't know what the procedures or the protocol were. I, I fully expected that there would be um, some support uh, from the church, but in the event, six years later, uh, after my complete exoneration and apology from the judge in court for a wrongful prosecution, still no visit, no official visit from anyone in the church hierarchy uh, to see how we are, whether how we're surviving, um, the offer of any support. Um, I did ask in the early days for some form of counselling. Uh, and I was given a series of cut price counselling uh, from one of the diocesan uh, people who um, I was then told after a few sessions that they'd run out of money and could no longer support this. But that, that was the only, the only concern that's been shown to us. And the same is true of the Methodist Church, because w when I was operating as a, as a priest in the Church of England, uh, with the permission of the bishop, I was also appointed as a recognised and regarded Methodist minister. So I was both a Methodist minister and an Anglican minister at the same time. But the Methodists have behaved in exactly the same way. No official has been to yeah. see how we are, although individual Christians have been great. So, so just to clarify for, for people watching this, Complete exoneration by the courts. This was this was a wrongful prosecution. The courts agreed with this. They said absolutely complete exoneration, and yet the church continued to I don't know behave as if as if you were a guilty man. Am I understanding that correctly? The the church's response has been to say that they want to have their own legal process. If I want to return to ministry, I have to agree to myself accessing a transcript of the two trials, because the first trial was actually a hung jury, so I, I was nearly given a prison sentence for something I didn't do. There are many others who have had prison sentences uh, as I know you're aware, um, who, who, who maintain their innocence. Um, 
but they want me to go through their legal process. Uh, it would cost me thousands of pounds to access this transcript. And I was warned that if the legal process that the church took me through decided that there was a possibility that I might be guilty on the balance of probability, uh, then although they were claiming this is not a juridical process, nevertheless, the result would have been, had they decided on the balance of probability that this may have happened, um, that I would have been given by them what amounts to a verdict of guilty. Yeah by the ecclesiastical court. It's called a, a risk assessment. Now, risk assessments are quite common in the whole of society these days, mm -hmm. and generally speaking, they're um, a, a, not a problem. Um, and generally speaking, they're probably a good thing to avoid risk and danger, although we do live in a completely risk-averse society now. Um, but for me, in my particular situation, and I know of others who've been through this process and have come out on the losing end of this, would be tantamount to a, a guilty verdict. This would then be recorded as, although the church claiming it not being a juridical process, as an actual judicial judgment and a condemnation and the verdict of guilty. The So, you the, we spoke about the the safeguarding process, which refers to you as the abuser Bef before a trial, before any evidence has been heard. Yeah. So that that would say to me that this is an organisation coming from a presumption of guilt that then wants to carry out this their own investigation if you like mm. to come to an impartial decision mm. while starting from a position of you're the abuser yeah how, how would that ever work I, the church claims to, to be in a learning process and and you know i hope that's true mm -hmm. um Nevertheless, uh, what happened immediately after my visit from the Archdeacon was a visit from the, the diocesan safeguarding officer um, who told me that I needed to sign a document for the safeguarding um, group in the church um, called a Covenant of Care. Now, this covenant of care, in their words, and I quote, was to facilitate the abuser to worship, celebrate and receive support while safeguarding vulnerable people and to provide evidence that the organisation is serious about obeying these safeguarding rules to protect the abused and vulnerable from abuse and to protect the abuser from further abusing. The abuser is me, of course. Yeah. This is a, I mean, this is a prejudgment, isn't it? Of, of, you know, here I am, the victim of someone who is so seriously mentally disturbed that she is regularly confabulating. I'll, I'll explain what that is at another point. Um, um, to treat this person as the victim that she claims she is and to believe her, therefore believing that I am actually an abuser. And it meant that um, I had to agree, I did sign this document because I was so ignorant and innocent and terrified by this process, um, which I was later told when I did finally get a solicitor I should never have signed. Now, the church should never have asked me to sign this document because um, as far as I am concerned, it may not have been an illegal act on their behalf, 
but it certainly was a questionable, questionably ethical act. Uh, yeah. And as it turned out, it was in fact, and it continues to be an abusive act. Because although when I was completely exonerated uh, by the judge, eventually after two years of trial and stress, um, the safeguarding officer emailed me to reassure me that they had um, um, torn up this and shredded this document. Do I believe them? <laughs> Do I really believe them? Is that document not somewhere hidden in my private Lambeth file? Now, I did access my Lambeth file. It was encrypted, and I'm not a, a, a tech whiz, but I, I got someone to decrypt it for me. And one of my dearest colleague friends, for whom I've worked for the past 20 years in a voluntary capacity as a priest with the, arch, with the bishop's permission to officiate, wrote to Lambeth or informed Lambeth that some years ago, when I found myself... Um, on benefit because I went through a very difficult divorce and was no longer operating for a period of time as a priest, needed to find some income because I was unemployed. I wrote to the local crematorium and said, if ever you need a priest uh, for, you know, for a funeral service and you can't get hold of one, give me a ring and I'll come and help. That would have been a form of income for me. Yeah. This priest discovered that and informed Lambeth that, quote, uh, Reverend Roy Catchpole is a cowboy priest looking to do funerals. A good friend. Yeah. And when I snubbed him in church after I discovered this, the, the message came back to me from two or three people. But the figure says you snubbed him in church on Sunday. Yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> but there was also um, the lies about other women waiting in the wings. Tell us about that. That's another um, colleague with whom I've worked. Um, the chief priest, if I may, may call him that, um, had written me a reference uh, for a parish post in which he included the fact that two of his associate priests had found me an invaluable aid in their ministries. One of these priests I discovered about six months ago, that is five and a half years after the first trial, and four and a half years after my public exoneration, we're still putting it around in the parish that there were allegations being made against me, in this case by four other women. Now, when I discovered this, and I was told this by another priest colleague whom I love and trust, I discovered that he'd not only told him that, but it also told the chief priest, who had also been spreading that rumour around. Um, this resulted in my wife and I actually making an informal approach to the bishop to have this man either disciplined um, or to write an apology yeah. to me, a, a written apology to me. Neither, neither of which have happened. The bishop uh, emailed me back to say that she didn't intend to discipline him and we have had no formal apology. I learned from the radio this morning that one of the protocols for making a, um, a complaint against the clergyman is that you have to make a formal complaint and provide evidence. I'm seriously considering whether I ought to do that now because mm. of the church has, has treated me and continues to treat me by, in because, effect, excommunicating me. Yeah, and the, these women didn't, they never existed, did they? No, the, these the women, women don't exist. No, they, no. Uh, they were, I, I approached the bishop and said, you know, I, who are these women? And she said, well, I, I've heard no such thing. 
no one has made an official complaint of that to me. I then um, contacted the diocesan secretary, who's the chief legal person in the diocese. He's heard nothing of this. There have been no allegations to him. Uh, I, I also was had it confirmed that the the diocesan safeguarding authority had also had no such allegations made to them. So, um, well, I know that there can't be unless they're liars or compensation seekers or or seriously mentally ill. But I mean, you know, th there has never been an occasion at which this could happen. I know that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, so, I don't go around abusing women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Just sort of on that note of, of rumour and people saying things that are not true, I know <clears throat> from my experience that people tend to make assumptions once an allegation or an accusation has been made. People make all sorts of assumptions about the person against whom the allegation is made or about the allegation itself. Uh -huh. So, you know, things like, well, there's no smoke without fire. What What sort of things... Did, did you hear in relation to, to your circumstances? Well, first, there's the whole thing about the balance of probability. People are inclined to believe that there is no smoke without fire. Um, but, you know, we live in a world where we can make smoke with no fire. Yeah. Um, I've heard people say, well, you know, he, look, he looks the kind of guy that might do that sort of thing. Um, n n not being your usual sort of middle class type public school, you know, elite kind of guy, um, but, you know, an, an, an ex-con from Borstal who's done pretty well much better academically in, in, than most of his colleagues, as it happens. Um, mm. So, you know, there's something about him that's not quite right, isn't there? Um, also, also, people say, well, why would a woman lie about this kind of, you know, why would a woman lie? You know, we, we know that women and children don't lie. You know, a woman is not going to make an allegation of sexual assault and put herself through all that mess of court um, and, and, and public humiliation um, on the basis of a lie. It must take enormous courage for a woman who's been abused to actually put herself through that mill. And, and that's true. And that's true for many. Most, if not all women who are, who are truly abused. Um, another reason a woman might lie, you know, you know, is because she's mentally ill or she's afraid of, um, of being discovered in an illicit relationship, uh, particularly young people who's who have authoritarian and violent parents um, or, or, you know, right-wing religious parents who might punish her for getting into a relationship. Um, there are people who just want attention and um, there are people who are groomed by um, people with vested interests, people at rape crisis centre people um, and, and social workers who you know, who, who may have a vested interest, say, in, in the Me Too movement and so on, um, to actually earn a living um, by supporting and either di directly or indirectly grooming um, people who have been into inappropriate or, or violent sexual relationships. There are some people who can't help telling lies, um, you know, people say things um, for for many different reasons. I mean, I, I mean, it, if you there are those who, and these are well documented, um, who want to make money uh, through making an allegation um, from the Criminal Injury Injuries uh, Compensation Authority. Um, if you go online. Um, um, onto their website, you'll find a list of um, amounts of money you can make from various abuses that you've suffered. Buggery is £10,000 a shot. Um, and, and believe it or not, this is actually stuff that's online. And um, there are those lawyers who will, um, on a no-win, no-fee basis, support these kinds of allegations and many many of these people have, have gone to the 
criminal injuries compensation authority and been given large amounts of money, thousands and hundreds of thousands of pounds, um, before any trial has ever taken place. That that shocked me when I first found out that the compensation is paid without there being any trial, any evidence. The, the allegations made and they get compensation. And yeah. that's the order of events. And then there might be a trial. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds to me like an incentive to lie, an incentive Absolutely. to make these allegations. Yeah. And, and with the, with the um, continuing um, um, poverty of legal aid services, mm. um, this is a means of the government um filling its prisons in order to support the those who benefit from working in prisons prison officers prison governors um, psychiatrists psychologists the medical profession working in prisons um, and all the support services it's a source of uh, free labor um, it's a source of um, um, moral rectitude for any government and, and, and both parties are involved in this yeah. um, both here and, and in the US um, it's an industry that is supporting I mean my first um, um, academic work was on, on the prison estate in the United Kingdom and that was 20 years ago and it, it, the prisons then contained 44,000 people now, 20 years later, there are nearly 100,000 people in, in UK prisons. You know, there's not been an improvement in the way uh, vulnerable, poor, black, mentally ill, um, abused um, people are treated uh, in, in, in a restorative way in, a, in the British prison estate. I mean, this, this, I know this is another thing, um, but it's, it's the important. reality. Yeah, it's a reality. Yeah. You know, it's, you need it's, your it's, prisons full, and if it means, um, if if it means people no longer being able to have access to the rule of law, innocent until proven guilty, then that's the cost. That's what it's going to have to be. Yeah, and we, we talked earlier because one of the things that that you you hear a lot of people saying when when you try to discuss this sort of thing with them, they say. Oh yeah, but it's it's really rare. Doesn't happen very often. And we were talking about fact, the um, organisation for falsely accused carers and teachers and other professionals. They've been going for twenty years. Mm. I mean, the, these false accusations can't be that rare if there's an organisation that's been dealing with them for twenty years. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we've been doing this for 20 years. And uh, the numbers of people are increasing daily. Um, yeah. Certainly in the last in the last few years, the, I think that the issue of false sexual allegations in particular has been starting to hit the headlines. There has been some publicity that, that there's an issue here. Hmm. But it, it seems to it gets a bit of publicity and then it seems to die away again. And under the surface, there are people like you, the length and breadth of this country, being falsely accused for, for, for the reasons you give, you know, sometimes sometimes mental health, sometimes um, the, the lure of compensation. But the fact is, once the allegation's made, it's almost as if there's no investigation no attempt to to gather facts. It's just, and and of course the the will be believed approach has been has had a big influence on that. Yeah, I mean, there's. I think the police, um, in, in in most, if not all, cases, are interested in finding evidence that supports their prosecution, and are not interested in finding evidence that supports the defence which is called exculpatory evidence. It's evidence that exculpates the accused from um, 
the possibility of their being guilty. Um, you know, very wealthy, well-known, rich people like Cliff Richards, Paul Gabriccini and people like that can afford to buy a decent defence being innocent. But the ordinary run of people like myself can't afford thousands of pounds to, you know, to confront these issues. Do, do, do you want me to tell you what, what the personal cost has been for me? Yes, yes. I mean, I think... Um, I, I founded a, a food bank as, as part of a retirement project mm -hmm. after my retirement. I've been planning this for some years. And, and I set up a, a food bank locally. Um, the, I resigned from that during the course of, obviously, for the sake of a reputation of the food bank, but was fully expecting to be reinstated with my exoneration. But the trustees of the food bank have decided not to have me back and, and refused to give me any reason. When I asked why, they said that they'd been bound by confidentiality not to tell me what had been said. Another thing is that I'm, I'm now always on the internet forever as an accused person. I've been deprived of all status, honours, recognition and regard by the Methodist Church and the Church of England. I don't expect that these will ever be returned. I was recently expelled from worship in my parish church after preaching and serving there for 20 years preaching. I've been deprived of my theological college and university teaching posts. I've been deprived of my custom with meeting with colleagues at chapter meeting. I mean, my only social life, and it sounds a bit sad, but my only social life was within the church, mm -hmm. among colleagues and friends and other Christians. So, you know, we've been socially excluded now as a, as a, a planet uh, for perhaps 12 weeks. I've been socially excluded for six years, yeah. plus 12 weeks. It does things to your head. Um, my social life has been emptied. Um, in the run-up to the trials, the trials themselves, and the subsequent period following my exoneration, uh, four years of this of this social isolation. I'm doing this broadcast now, but I've lost confidence to re-enter society, really, as a credible person. Um, the trauma caused by this whole process lowered my immune system to such a degree that it made me vulnerable to a terminal cancer, um, which I'm now uh, a victim of. Um, I've been de-skilled, de-platformed. I think the biggest thing is that I'm much less likely now to trust people, colleagues, and especially institutions. Um, I think of institutions that they're a mafia, a mm -hmm. self-interested group who are interested in protecting their own backs, in maintaining their positions and status within society, um, and who are not able um, or have the resources to seek justice. Um, and, and finally, I think I was recently diagnosed uh, as suffering uh, from post-traumatic stress disorder. So I'm now a victim of PTSD. So an enormous cost for something really that should never have happened because they found information about your accuser that should have should have rung alarm bells right at the beginning, didn't they? Well, they had the information, but they were unable or unwilling, uh, depending on your view, to actually access the information. Six years, um, um, 20 years before this woman made these allegations against me, she brought her employer to court who was found guilty of exactly and precisely the same allegations that she was making against me 
down to every single detail. Um, had they accessed that information, which they said they'd lost, of the transcript of that previous trial 20 years ago, they would never have brought me to court. Yeah. Now, whether they had access to that and knew what was in that transcript, but decided that it was cheaper to prosecute me than to risk an inquiry and an appeal for the wrongful imprisonment of this man 20 years ago, who knows? Mm. <coughs> who knows? Yeah. I mean, I'm prepared to believe any corrupt behaviour of any established institution because of my recent experience of the way institutions work. Yeah, because... It doesn't the, the, revolutionary. It makes me a damaged, hurt and, and vulnerable victim. Yeah, yeah. It, there was also the, the irregularity of how the accuser was treated when she first made her allegation. I th because of the resources that <coughs> the estate makes available to uh, people who make allegations, um, she was very, very much supported and I think personally groomed um, both by professionals that were employed to support her and also by the um, amateur group who surrounded her in the church either willingly, knowingly or unwillingly and ignorantly um, were also involved in the process of her grooming um, who, encourage, who, would encourage, who encouraged her um, there are people in the church now who in that support group and I know who they are uh, who just simply will not talk to me mm. because they continue to... It, it's, it's what's called cognitive dif dissonance. You know, you, believe, you know that two things are true. You know that this woman has made these allegations and you believe and trust her, so does the state. But you know also that this, this vicar was found to have been wrongly prosecuted by, by the state. So the state are telling you two opposite and contradictory things how do you hold these things together yeah. there's a dissonant chord within your brain within your understanding you can't put it together so what you do is you ignore that reality and you choose to believe what you decided to believe in the first place yeah. <coughs> despite the evidence it's yeah. like um in the New Testament, Jesus ascended into heaven into a cloud and the disciples watched as he went up into heaven. But at the same time, you know, people don't levitate. Yeah. So what do you do with that? You, you kind of put your belief into one compartment called religion and faith and you put your rational knowledge into another called science but the two, you never put the two together because they, they, they create a dissonant chord. Yeah, yeah. This is what the church caring arm, the pastoral arm, ought to be addressing with those people who are suffering from this dissonance. I mean, you know, my great wish is that these people receive and that we receive a ministry of love and care, which is properly informed, which is professional, and which is healing and restoring. I don't want anybody hurt because of this. You know, I want us all to be made well. Yeah. Wouldn't that be good? Yeah. It's the thing I want more than anything else. And, and, and you know, until the day I die, I'm going to be fighting for that to happen. Whether this broadcast is going to help that, I don't know. I, I, I'm yeah. aware that I'm risking a lot by doing this. Yeah, we can only put the information out there and try to help people understand how, how these situations develop, how they're allowed to develop and, and how they're allowed to continue when, when common sense says 
they should they should never get as far as they get. They should never they should never get off the ground, and yet we know they do, and we know they do over and over and over again. So I guess what we're saying now is how, how do we find a way to address that? How do we find a way to turn that around? And and because you said earlier, you are a victim, and yet you continue to be victimized. For, for for what reason? You know that that's what I, I don't understand. For what reason? I th I don't think the Church of England or the Methodist Church are unique in the way they treat no. people like me. It's it's an institutional thing, and you know, and, and it, it applies to international, international, and corporate institutions throughout the planet. Um, their their major response seems to be a reaction to cover their back, yeah. to um, have a concern for the reputation of the institution rather than uh, a desire for justice and truth. Yeah. Now, you know, my 16-year-old ideologue is coming across here where you know wouldn't it be nice to get justice rather than protection of of one's reputation would that be good uh is it going to happen you know commissions of inquiry learnings of lessons um uh, scapegoating of individuals um payments of compensation to people who claim things, you know, all the, these things are all very well. Um, but really what it's about, it's, a, it's about justice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I forgot to ask you earlier, was there, excuse me, <coughs> was there much media interest or coverage in your case? Well, two things. First, we decided we wouldn't look on Twitter or Facebook during this whole process because we couldn't have coped with that. No. The other has been, that in our experience, the press have been good. Oh, really? Yeah. The, the local press uh, published it as it came out. Um, but on my exoneration, I contacted the editor and said I needed to write an article. For the front page, uh, where the local press had put it on the front page, they allowed me to do that. They published it on the front page. Um, locally, everyone is fine. The village is fine. The church is fine. You know, my friends in the church and other people. Um, no problem. Now, I know that this is an unusual thing for someone to be able to say but that that's been the truth of it yeah yeah uh, they haven't um, abused or manipulated me that i'm aware of in any way yeah because that I'm, is I'm, unusual. I'm, I'm going off now because my battery's dying. oh are you, are you just about to die well before you do i just want to see roy has written a book about his experiences if anybody would like to get a hold of it, if you go to our website, um, the truthseekerproject.org, there's a link directly to the book where you can buy a copy and read the whole story of how this all happened and how it all came about. But if we're about to lose you, Roy. <laughs> Sandra, it's been great having this opportunity to meet you and to talk to you. And thank and, you so uh, much for, for being so open with us. No problem. Take care now. You too. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.